2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Last part of that verse says that He's the God of all comfort. If you'll give me attention tonight, I want to preach on that thought. The God of all comfort. That's a blessing. Every Christian comes to the point in their life where they need comfort. The loss of a loved one. A layoff slip. Not able to pay your bills. I was at four people approached me when I walked in the door last Sunday morning saying, our power is getting ready to be turned off. Can't pay our bills. Getting ready to get kicked out of the apartment. Four last Sunday morning. I think only two this morning. That's, that's pretty low. Um, yeah, sometimes you try and try and try. And it seems like the harder you try, the worse it gets. And every one of us as Christians comes to a point in our life where we need comfort. Um, we have on our, our beds, I got one on my bed at home. Well, a thing that we call a comforter. And uh, I don't know who started calling that. That's a good name for them. Mine's uh, 100% cotton outside and goose down feathers inside. That's the best thing on this planet. It is. Keep you warm. It really is. I'm telling you, I turn the heat down to zero nearly. And I burn up underneath that thing. It comforts me in a cold, cold winter night. It's a comfort. And the Bible said that God is a comforter. And the Bible said the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. And I will just look at that briefly tonight because I'm telling you, if you're not in a place where you need comforting, you're going to be in a place where you need comforting. You, if you're not in one now, it, one's coming your way. You can mark it down. Uh, when, you, when you start to get ahead, everything falls apart. I was, uh, some of my cousins visited my mom this evening while I was up there with my sister. I left, we went and got something to eat, and I went straight, went on to Old Fort, and spent the evening up there. Come back home, stayed a little while, uh, washed my face and neck, and changed clothes, and come on to church tonight. And uh, I was telling some of my, my uh, cousins, they were talking about days gone by, and they were talking about my mom, and they were talking about daddy, my dad. And, uh, and my, uh, my cousin's husband, he was talking about daddy, and I said, you know, I talked about how hard my mom had had it, and my dad was never around when we was little. He's always working. Always. And my cousin's, uh, my cousin's husband said, you know, your daddy, he worked harder than anybody I've ever seen. He said, I ain't never seen nobody work like him. He's worked as long at the mill as they would let him. Much overtime, two shifts, three shifts, whatever. And he'd do it. I ain't kidding you. He could go and go and go and go. And that put a lot of the burden on mom. Uh, because of him being gone all the time and working. But, but, uh, they begin to talk and I begin to remember some things our family had been through. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna say a whole lot tonight because, uh, I don't want you to think, feel sorry for me or any of us or anything like that. But, um, the devil hit our family hard back, uh, several years ago and, and um, I, I began to think about of the things that had happened just in our home, and there was a time when everything was going great. There was a time when everything's going wonderful. And it will in your life too. Um, at one time, um, I was preaching all the time, and uh, my dad had got saved, got in church every Sunday morning. Daddy'd come put on a shirt and a tie. He'd always, I mean, he'd get, uh, he'd get to. He, my daddy would wear the weirdest things together. Whatever he got for Christmas, he got a new tie and a new shirt and a new pair. It didn't matter what color he wore, all his new clothes at the same time. And he'd have on, a, you know, green pants, red shirt and a tie or something. And I mean, walk in there like he owned Marion, I'm telling you. And sit on the front row, because his boy was preaching. Uh, amen. And uh, he went up in West Virginia and told, he went up in West Virginia and told all my kin folks that he built New Manor. <laughs> he sure did. And he, they said, now, now, your daddy built that church, didn't he? I said, well, he helped. Uh, but anyway, the truth is, uh, the truth is, I had to watch him all the time. He's carrying off stuff. 
I'd seen him. He'd have, a, he'd have a load of blocks and two by sixes on his truck. And I said, where are you going with that stuff? He said, well, they're not going to use this. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I mean, he had blocks, two by fours, and plywood and everything, <laughs> carrying it off from the job site. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, uh, he was going to church. And my uh, one brother-in-law, he had got saved, and I was talking to him. I was up at my sister's house, and he, he, he got saved, and he, uh, uh, I started talking to him. We, we was eating, eating, and he bowed his head and started crying and got saved right there and went to the refrigerator and pulled out a six-pack case of beer and popped them one at a time and poured them down the sink. Right there, buddy. I mean, like 30 seconds after he gets saved. You know, I wonder about people who've been saved ten years and still don't see nothing wrong with it. Really? Uh, come on now. And, uh, and he, uh, he'd been saved 30 seconds before that stuff down the sink. My other brother-in-law, my sister Sandy, up that lived way up on Buck Creek, he got saved. And they made him a deacon in the church. And the Sandy had got saved, and she was playing the piano. She was playing the piano in church and, and leading her youth choir. She had a little choir, and she'd play the piano, and she wrote songs. And, and uh, uh, that, that was my sister that could, could buy, you know, she could do anything, anything. You name it, she could do anything. And my other sister, she was always real bookish, Debbie, and wanted to study all the time. And uh, that, she'd become a failure. But uh, uh, no. uh, but anyway, that's what studying will get you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All the mamas get mad at me when I say stuff like that. But anyway, she's not a failure now, that's for sure. Uh, but anyway, um, everything was going great. One brother-in-law was a preacher. One brother-in-law was a deacon. One sister leading the choir. Other sister teaching special citizens, handicapped people. I was preaching all over the country. I mean, boy, we as a, we as a, God was blessed. But you know, every time you get to the point in your life where it seems like everything's going good, you can mark it down, something's coming bad. And within two years, every bit of that changed. Every bit of that. Y'all know some things that I went through. My, my other sister, uh, her husband got divorced. My other oldest sister, Sandy, died with cancer. My dad dropped dead with a heart attack within two years. Our whole family, you wouldn't believe what my family went through. And during those times, I learned what it meant to have to have some comfort. I learned that you've got to have comfort. I'm glad that the Bible said that He's the God of all comfort. You find out what kind of religion you've got when you go through hard times in your life. You find out if what you've got will stand the test when hard times come in your life. You find out if what you got's real when when you go through valleys and 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 the and the bottom falls out or the top falls in. I've had both. I've had the bottom fall out and the top fall in about the same time. And I'm telling you what, brother, it's during those times that you grow. It's during those times when you're hurting, when you're going through a divorce or you're going through a separation or you're, when you're hurting so bad you can't stand it and you feel like the whole world's against you and you feel like, brother, it's during that time when he'll step up right beside you and like put his arm around you and say, I'll never leave you. Glory to God, I'll never forsake you. Amen. And he's the comforter tonight. I want to say a few things about it and we'll go. First of all, I want to say he comforts us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He comforts us. The Bible said in Mark Mark chapter 4, there was a man in the synagogue with a withered hand. They were all watching him. It was sad. It was sad. But instead of trying to help that man with a withered hand... They was watching the Lord to see if He was going to help him so they could criticize him. Don't pay no attention to these religious people that's always wanting to criticize and always wanting to make fun or make, poke a critical finger or point a finger at somebody doing something for God. I don't have any five seconds to waste on people that don't do nothing but criticize anybody else trying to do something for God. If somebody's trying to do something for God, let them go, brother. More power to them than their own master. They stand or fall. And so uh, the Lord touched that man and he comforted comforted him, much to their dismay. Amen. They still, they, they couldn't believe it. They didn't want him to have nothing to do with him. But the Lord was there. We see him with the woman at the well. He didn't look down at her and say, you sorry, good for nothing thing. Been married five times, shacking up with somebody. He said, I'm going to help you and forgive that woman and send her on the way. That's Jesus. I'm telling you, he saw, uh, found the woman caught in adultery. He didn't kick her and say, you good for nothing thing. We're kicking you out and not having nothing else to do with you. 
He said, go and sin no more. Amen. That's Jesus. I'm glad the Lord comforts us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Lazarus was dying, you know what they told him? They said, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. John chapter 11. He whom thou lovest is sick. It didn't say, Lord, he whom lovest thou is sick. It wasn't that John loved Jesus. They said, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. I'm glad. People say, boy, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I do too. I'm glad you do. But the best thing is, he loves us. He loves me. He loves you. Have I told you all that lately? He loves you. Amen. He comforts us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, somebody said, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. That's what Charles Wagle wrote. He come in one day, and he was a great preacher. And old Charles Wagle, uh, he, he was a great preacher a hundred years ago. And he came in one day, and there was a note on the table from his wife. She said, I don't want to be married to a preacher. I'm not going to stay married to you, and I'm gone out the door. Now, I've heard people criticize people like that. And I've heard people say, well, I'll tell you one thing. I don't know. But you listen, he come in one day. His, there's a note on the table. His wife was gone. And Charles Wagle's heart broke because he was used to having her a companion, somebody to talk to, somebody to lean on, somebody to confide in, somebody to put your head on his shoulder and cry. And she is gone, brother. She's gone. Charles Wagle sat down at the piano and wrote this song, and he put a little chord out, and he said, I'd love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in Him a friend so kind and true. And he wrote the great song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. I'm telling you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, this thing is real. When everything goes south and everything goes bad, He'll slip up beside you, put His arm around you, and say, Glory to God, I'll comfort you. He's real tonight, and He'll comfort you. He comforts us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, that He comforts us through the work of the Holy Spirit. He sure does. I read about George Matheson. He was engaged. He was in love with this beautiful young lady, and they were going to get married. And he went to the doctor, and he found out he had something wrong with his eyes, and he's going blind. And he told her, he said, honey, I love you. I can't wait for us to be married, but I'm going blind. And she thought about it for a while, and she said, I can't marry a blind man. And broke off the engagement. You say, well, if she really tell you, I mean, you know, maybe you criticize. I don't know. You might do the same thing if you was in them shoes. I don't know. I hope you would. And he sat down and wrote, oh, love that will not let me go. One of the greatest songs ever. In Genesis 24, Rebecca got scared and worried, and the servant comforted her. In the middle of the night, when you don't know what to do or where to turn, he can whisper peace to your troubled soul. There ain't nobody, there ain't nobody can help you like he can. I remember one night I was having some very bad problems. I mean, I mean, you know me, it's hard to get me really down. I stay up most of the time. I hardly ever get down. But buddy, I'll tell you, you can hang on to take so much. And you can get down. Anybody can. Anybody can. Don't ever think you're so tough and you're so strong that you can't get down. You can. Anybody can. We're all flesh. And I remember one night up when uh, we was building that building at New Manor, and I come on, boy, I'm telling you, the devil was fighting. Lord, have mercy. The trusses had already fell in one time. We got them up the second time, uh, rebuilding again. Had to build all that two times. And, boy, I'm telling you, some other things was happening in my own personal life that it was so hard. I don't, I don't see how I could go another day. I'm telling you, I was hurting inside. Troubles outside. Troubles inside. I was preaching every night. I remember coming in there at 11 o'clock at night and pulling my car up like so the lights would shine in the building so I could see what the men got done. Sometimes they would be men up on scaffolds hanging sheetrock at 11 o'clock at night uh, trying to get that building built. And boy, I remember going in there one night all by myself and I looked around and we had this big rock wall went up like this right here and I was looking at it like that and all of a sudden the devil got on me. He said, you sorry, good for nothing. You'll never make it. 
I'm going to get you. This will never get finished. This will never get done. And boy, I tell you, I begin to, I begin to sing a song. And if somebody had been out there drunk in the parking lot, they'd have thought I was crazy. But I started going through there, and I began to sing. And I started singing a song. Uh, I, I began to walk through there, and I started saying, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. And you know what? The Lord had come down there and just hugged me. And it felt like one day turned into another day. And another day turned into another day. And another day turned into another day. I'm telling you tonight, people, through many dangers, tolls, and snares, I have already come. It's the same God that's brought me through all the other will take us the rest of the way. Are you listen to me tonight? He's the God of all comfort. He'll be there when nobody else will. When your friends are gone, when your family's gone, when the burdens are heavy and the money's gone, He'll be there and comfort you if you'll let Him. I'm talking about something that's worth a million dollars to every one of us tonight. I know, I don't know for sure how long it's going to be, but my mom, unless God does a miracle, ain't going to be here long. She's not eat that much food since Thanksgiving. Not a plate. Just a couple of bites. This we didn't eat a bite since Thursday. And I told my sister, I said, Debbie, that's mom. That ain't just anybody else. That's my mama. I mean, I stand it. I've been there for everybody else's family dying. I've been in the funeral home a thousand times. All right. I said, that's my mom. They ain't going to make another one when she's gone. And I've tried to prepare myself for this for many, many years. At least 20. 20 years I've been preparing myself for what I'm fixing to go through. You say, well, ain't there nothing? She's had strokes, and she's had, and you know, she, she's just shutting down. And if I let myself think about it, through everything that I've ever been through in my life, there's been one person that's always been there. That's my mama. Daddy, I loved him to death, but you know how daddy was. He, daddy wasn't even at the hospital when none of us was born. He was like a wild animal when Mom brought him down here from West Virginia. Really, he was. He'd, he'd go to the store, get a loaf of bread, and come back two days later. That's just the way he was. He finally, she civilized him. But it took some work. Lord, what my mom's went through and what she's put up with. It was her that carried him girls around when they was babies. And, of course, when Carrie come along, she... She, along with my mom, I've just raised Chris and Corey. And I got to thinking about where I could have been without her. You wouldn't be looking at me preaching right now if it wasn't for her. I guarantee you that. There ain't no telling where I'd be if it wasn't for my mom. Lord, my daddy to raise me, Lord, I don't know where I'd be right now. Hell, Hollywood, or worse. My daddy raised me. And so I was driving up to Old Fort today, and I got to thinking. I thought, I don't know about if I can stand this. And then I called Teresa, and she said, Brother Danny, my mom's on a ventilator, and they might unplug her this evening. She said, We need you. And I said, I'm getting ready to go see Mom right now, Teresa. I said, I'll come over at night. She said, I don't want to sound selfish. She said, y'all been, the church has been so good to us. I don't mean to. She said, I know that other people got burdened and stuff. But she said, we need you. So immediately I had to switch over from quit worrying about my mom's. Because that's our church member's mom. And then I called Carrie and I said, Carrie. And it just hit me. I thought, I ain't got no pastor to call. And I'm not complaining. My pastor's 87 years old. In South Carolina, so I ain't got a wife to lay my head on 
and say, honey, please help me pray. I ain't got, no, I don't have a pastor that'll come to me and come to my mom's house tonight. But let me tell you what I've got. Let me tell you who I've got. I've got the one that said, I'm the God of all comfort. He can do more than a pastor. He can do more than a family. Brother, He's brought me through over and over. when you find out if your religion's real. Religion's real. The old song says, He abides, He abides, Hallelujah, He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the Comforter abides with me. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 said, Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The next thing I want to say is God comforts us through His children. You know, you can get a lot of comfort through each other. That's why you don't need to get out of church. You need to stay in church. The devil will prosper you, make sure you're making a lot of money. While everything's good, if you're not careful, you'll get out of church. Then when tragedy hits, buddy, you by yourself out there. And the devil ain't going to comfort you when trouble hits your house. And them wicked friends you party with ain't going to comfort you when you get down and out. You know who's going to be there? Your family... I know you ain't supposed to wipe snot on your face while you're preaching, but you're as redneck as I am, so don't worry about it. <laughs> and they, them party friends ain't going to help you. They ain't going to help you. It's a real blessing to have family and friends. When my dad died, I, I, could, I don't know how many hundreds of people. My phone rung off the hook. Well, Danny, you was there when my daddy died. Brother Danny, you came to the funeral home. Brother Danny, you came, and I just wanted to tell you I love you and pray. It just, I mean, you couldn't even hang the phone up. Pray the ring again. It's a blessing to be comforted through brothers and sisters in Christ. They said one time, this boy, a young boy had an accident, and uh, he lost his arm. They had to cut his arm off. Lost his arm. And he was at home, and he felt real bad, and he was bitter and got mad at the world, wouldn't talk to nobody. And one day a preacher come to see him. His daddy had asked this preacher to come visit him. And he said, son, I've got a preacher here who wants to see you. He said, I don't want to talk to no preacher. Why would I want to talk to a preacher? What God let happen to me? I don't want... He said, son, just let him come in for a minute. He said, all right. And the preacher walked in, and he didn't have an arm. And when that boy saw that that preacher didn't have an arm, he immediately said, I want to talk to you. And the preacher said, Son, when I was a young boy, I had an accident and lost my arm too. And that boy connected with him, and they began to talk. And he helped him. I ain't stupid. You know why God's let me go through so much? You know what the Lord's done with me? Over and over and over again. He's dangled me out in front of people and said, Look at that. You can do this to him. You can do that to him. You can do this to him, that to him. He's still trusting me. I can still help him through it. I ain't stupid. I know what he's doing to me. He's used me as a guinea pig, as an example, to show you it can be done with nothing else but him. Nothing else. I don't have... What a preacher's... I don't have their backing. I don't have the support of the community. I don't have the support of other churches. Brethren, nothing, brother. And the Lord says, you can do it anyway. And He wants you to know that too tonight. You don't really have to have nothing but Him. That's right. That's right. You don't have to... As long as you got the Lord, you've got everything you need. You may not think you do, but you do. He comforts us finally through the promise of His coming. Won't be long now. You heard me preach on the signs this morning. It ain't gonna be long now. I love the song we used to sing. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. 
I mean, it's been ten years since I heard about it. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All sorrow will be over in that God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. That's it, buddy. He'll comfort you through His promise of His coming. Let's stand by our heads for prayer.